callers and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to the hit show, Questionable Conversations Radio, with Dr. Glenna Rice on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Are you a busy parent? Are you deeply invested in your personal health and success? Questionable Conversations Radio is a space that explores different parenting methods, examines healthier lifestyles, and explores what else is possible to guide you toward a successful career. Is your fast-paced lifestyle draining all of your energy? Join Dr. Glenna as she shares her motherly wisdom, offers her expertise in body transformation, and gives insights on her personal experience as a successful businesswoman. The answers are in front of you. All you need are the right questions. Now here's your host. Dr. Glenna Rice and me, Dr. Pat. We're here today. We get to do this together. It's very, very cool. Um, One of the things I love about this is we're looking at the world and we're looking through multifaceted lenses. You know, when you hear the introduction of who Dr. Glenna Rice is and what she does about parenting, but also business and your body, then one of the things you do is you put it all together in terms of questionable conversations. And what that means when you say questionable conversations, what you're really talking about is what would happen if we lived in the question? What would happen to a, what would happen if there was a series of questions that we might ask that lead us to the path of possibilities as opposed to the path of problems? What if we looked at the creative energy and life force of the universe in the way that it provides us with possibilities and solutions to even the most bizarre scenarios or situations because it's all there. But today we're talking about the earth and we're talking about the earth in the face of what many of us have looked at that is going on in the world today. You know, I personally growing up on the East coast, Glenna is and you know, this right those of us that lived in toxic realms, right? And I mean, anybody that knows anything knows a lot about the Hudson River, the Jersey Shore, you know, the dumping of pharmaceutical chemicals uh, from hospitals all along any corridor over there and what that was like. You know, the fact that giant oil tankers would drive up the Hudson and open up their back drop and clear out the oil from inside. I mean, all of those things sound bizarre, but we live in a day and time today where many people believe that this is a thing of the past, but today's show is different. You know, you're a parent, you're an access consciousness facilitator, you're somebody that teaches these conversations all over the world, you help people clear energy out, and you ask us questions about what is it we can do from facilitating and speaking from this place of changing and changing in the way that can truly create a difference? So today you're taking on a topic, which is, I believe, one of the most important conversations we can have in contemporary time. Why is this so important to you? What is the conversation about what does the earth require from you? What is this really about for you? Oh, wow. Thank you for the introduction. Fun to have be on with you <laughs> today. Oh, it is an important conversation. It's a valuable conversation. And it's, I think it's a conversation a lot of people are having from a place of, you know, fear and angst and problems. And there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, they're talking about in 12 years, we may not be able to change the path that we're on with the planet, that it will be kind of an unrecoverable future to have a planet that's sustainable and beautiful and livable. Um, so I think for me, that's important. I do have kids and I'll may have grandchildren and great grandchildren and great, great grandchildren. And a lot of us will. And I would love them to enjoy this beautiful planet I live on and have been enjoying my whole life um, with ease, with abundance, with beauty all around us, not with like toxic 
dumps into our water. <laughs> That's yeah. a horrible story. <laughs> it is a horrible story. Let me tell you what's even more horrible is me uh, as a youngster, let me just say maybe teenager, maybe early 20s, right? That time mm -hmm. period, walking what was known today, we call it the Jersey Shore, right? Yeah. But walking on the beach, like most people do, no shoes on, walking and stepping on a hypodermic needle. Okay. So yeah. that's the reality of what we're talking about, right? Yeah. That, that, and, and, and you have to ask yourself this question, Glenna. If it happens at a, at a place that's so open and popular and too public, right? Everybody yeah. knows the shoreline. Everybody knows New York. What's happening places that are not in the public view, right? And, mm -hmm. and yet we've made great strides. Uh, thank you, Greenpeace. We've made great strides. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, even the, I mean, I'm so excited about this conversation about the Green New Deal. Just a conversation. I mean, there's a lot of points of views in it. I can't say I agree with. Well, it had. It's just a conversation right now. What's it going to create? You know, it, it change is really about looking at what you would like to create as a future and creating the choices that will contribute to that. Because your choices always create. And what choices can you make every day that create a greater future for you? You know, you, your family, your life, your house, your everything around you, but also for the future of this planet. And when someone's dumping, like a hospital's dumping hypodermic needles into, you know, areas where children are playing and they're going to float, duh, <laughs> wash up on shores, are they even looking anywhere? Wow, if we dump these needles in the ocean, what's it going to create in the future? Is anyone having that conversation in these big businesses? I'm not about stopping big businesses. I'm about asking big businesses to have um, a benevolence and a future looking way of creating. So they're looking at what every choice they make and what it creates, including creating more profitability for everybody in the businesses. I mean, you can be profitable and clean at the same time. I know that is a possibility because when you put the two words together, it feels kind of light and bubbly, <laughs> you know? And that's, if, if people were looking from that point of view, what would that be creating? And not just a couple of us, like if more, the more people that are starting to look at, if I choose this, what will it create? We get a couple of CEOs, more people in business looking at this from that place. What could we change on the planet? You know, the planet isn't, um, the planet doesn't need saving. It's fine. <laughs> it's gonna be around for millions and millions of years, long after I'm here. Um, pollution is not going to kill the planet. What it's going to kill is life on the planet. We yeah. won't have a sustainable planet to live on. Is that something you're interested in? Yeah. The problem I see, the biggest problem I see is people aligning and agreeing and resisting and reacting. And I talk about this in a lot of our conversations is when you align and agree or resist and react with any point of view, you can't change it. You have locked that in place. Mm -hmm. So when you're in this fight to change these things, the fight against people that are doing pollution that are polluting and using up our resources and not cleaning up after themselves. It doesn't create the change. You want to have an awareness of what they're creating and what their creations are creating for the future and the choices that are making and then ask questions is how can we change that? Yeah. Then the possibilities start showing up. Absolutely. And, yeah. and when you're talking about this, so I, I want to get back to something you said. Because everybody is talking about the Green New Deal or not talking about the Green New Deal. But you know what I love about it and I love about what you said? Even though many of us may or may not agree with every single part of it, it had to be an extreme proposition. Had to be an extreme proposition to demonstrate that we are in a crisis right now with this. Um, I got to interview Gloria Rubin uh, a couple of years ago, and, and we're trying to uh, locate that interview because we want to replay it. Uh, Gloria Rubin is a Canadian-born uh, actor. You know, she's in some of my favorite, you know, TV shows now, Blind Spot, Cloak and Dagger, right? She's out there. But she has been an activist and one of the primary activists to clean up the Hudson, right? Mm -hmm. She has been all over it for decades and decades and decades. But even with all of that, the Hudson River folks I'm talking about, right, just right now, with, even with that, I am shocked to tell you, even with every bit 
of what we know about the Hudson, every bit, it is still number two on the list of at risk water portways. How wow. can that be, right? I mean, you would think yeah. that with all of the publicity, everything about the New York Harbor, all the Great Bays, the Highlands, the Mid Hudson, all of that up to Albany, that we would have enough to say, you got to stop, we're watching. But isn't this interesting that even with all of the watching of that, and thanks to Riverkeeper, hello, riverkeeper.org, riverkeeper.org, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, even with all that, it's like another day in the history of loosening up the EPA regulations. Mm -hmm. So the question that you ask is, what does the earth require from you? Yeah. That is definitely what today is. And we have to explore that from every part of who we are, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I teach a lot of work. I work a lot with bodies and I travel around the world teaching classes with on body work. Um, and I kind of see our... Our bodies is like little earths, you know, yes. there's, <laughs> there's nothing, nothing from our bodies that comes from anywhere else but this planet. We create our whole body from the molecules that are here, the food that's here, the air that we breathe that's here constantly. So looking at having a sustainable earth is that looking at having a sustainable life for us too. It's so much bigger than um, recycling, though recycling is great. Don't stop recycling. That is not what I'm saying. Let's make that work even better because you're hearing stories about what's happening with our bottles now going, they're not going to where they used to go and we have no place to put them. Um, and it, but to create, to create the bodies that will be sustainable and healthy and enjoyable, our earth has to contribute to that. And to see our bodies as a contribution every day to the earth, it's really seeing, having a communion with the earth, listening to what the earth is asking for. And it, everybody has energies that contribute to the earth. They have a way of being that contributes. Our footsteps on the earth are a contribution if we allow ourselves to have that and recognize it, acknowledge it, and ask for more of that. And that being a contribution, then the earth can start contributing speaking with us energetically, you know, don't dump this stuff in the Hudson. I can help you clean it up if you stop doing some of this. What would the earth say if we had more of a communion? What could it contribute to showing us multitudes of possibilities to create a change? Because, you know, if we ask, we receive. And if we ask for something greater, the things that will start showing up will be what we can follow to create the greatness we're asking for. Um, but we can't be judging that's where we get really messed up when we are judging things as good or bad or right or wrong at all. We stop being able to see or perceive any of the things that can contribute to creating the changes we're asking for. And I think most people on the planet would like to have healthy bodies. That's a place to start. They'd like to not live in filth and they like good air to, air to breathe. These are not crazy ideas in any way, shape or form. They like beaches to be able to go into and not walk on hypodermic needles. <laughs> You know, I, and I'm telling you that part of this is really having the courage to ask the question. So can we please talk about having the courage to ask the question? Because part of this is knowing that there are questions that are out there that I believe do require courage, even in a public forum. And especially now that we're talking about this, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. And when we come back, we're going to look at and explore this question and whether or not this is something you've ever asked, right? Does the earth really require? What does the earth really require? But let's, let's try this one. This is the one I like that uh, Dr. Glenna put together. What energies are destructive to the earth? Wait, wait. What energies are destructive to the earth? Let's take a short break, everybody. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. And for those of you out there, uh, look, I uh, just got a message. I did say Gloria Rubin. I did. And it's R-E-U-B-E-N. 
And if you go back, what you'll do is you'll find that she has been, and yes, you're absolutely right. I just got a text from somebody. You're absolutely right. She's now an advocate for HIV and AIDS patients. That's for sure. But she also, if you go back to 11 and 12, you, you will find her speaking on some of the largest stages when it comes for her work uh, to answer the question that Dr. Glenna Rice has uh, posed today. What does the earth require from you? Before we continue with this and talk about the energies of destructive, are destructive to the earth, I want to ask you a question. I know you're traveling, but I know you work with people all over the world. How can people find out more about you, Dr. Glenna? Yeah, I have my new website up now, <laughs> Dr. Glenna Rice. That's the easiest way. It's still in the works, but it's up and running. Um, and you can also find me Facebook. Glenna Rice is my personal page. Dr. Glenna Rice is my Facebook, um, I guess they call them professional pages. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm all over the place. You can also um, find my classes and all my workshops at the Access Consciousness website. And that's accessconsciousness.com slash Dr. Glenna Rice. And that will find my list of upcoming workshops around the world. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. So much here. And by the way, uh, Jessica will make sure we get your radio page up with your widget. Um, one of the things I want to do is I want to talk to you about two questions. Um, one is, what if it's not about saving the earth, but creating a sustainable future, right? What do you yeah. know? So we're going to talk about that. But I want to get to this one that you presented to us. Mm -hmm. What energies are destructive to the earth? Uh, we so don't talk about that very no. often. No. But let me hear your perspective on that. Well, judgment is probably the energy that's the most destructive to anything because it stops possibilities. So it creates, when you judge something, you lock it in place. And if you judge something is bad, if you judge that the earth needs to be saved and it's gonna, it's devastated and we only have 12 years and you come from a judgment, not from a question, then you and your point of view contributes to that point of view. And I have to say that we're really, really potent. Every one of you, if you're sitting in your, you know, living room just watching tv all day you know you still have a point of view that's really potent that contributes to that so what you judge is what you create your point of view creates your reality if you're coming from questions and possibilities then you're going to be creating that which is a generative energy and a creative energy and you can change those questions all the time so if your questions aren't working so great you can continue to change them judgments don't the other is we we know that like you know that Emoto, I'm saying the guy, the water guy, that if you, you know, put anger and hate on water or plants, they create that anger, rage, fury, and hate. Those are really destructive energies. They're not creative energies. I mean, being angry to the point where you start to ask questions can be creative. It can be a potency, but being rageful and that those ugly, angry energies do not contribute to creating more possibilities. That's what they contribute. They contribute to destroying um, what we're trying to create. And if you're willing to be a question and not have a point of view, you can change so many things about this planet. Things that are so outside of our imagination. But I mean, I have a great story that I love from years ago when my children were small. We had had a fire on the hill I live in on up in here in San Rafael, California, and it was coming over the top of the hill towards the homes. And we were evacuated and we were down at the bottom of the hill and everyone was looking. And I, I, I actually called up um, Gary Douglas, or my son did actually, the founder of Access Consciousness and said, ah, help, the hill's burning. <laughs> um, because is there anything we can do? Can we ask the fire to change? And he's like, no, there's too many people invested in the point of view that this fire is burning for you to be able to change it. When we're all invested in a point of view about something showing up, that creates more of that point of view. So me and my three kids are sitting there looking up at this fire and people are wondering why we weren't freaking out as much as we should have been because our house was really, the flames are getting really close. And I said to the kids, I said, could we talk to the wind? Maybe we could ask the wind to change. Yeah. So the, the four of us just went, could you blow another direction? What would that take? And duck that within 10 seconds, the flames started moving the other way. And they didn't burn any of the houses. I mean, it, it was being willing to look at the point of view. Everyone's fixated on, around it. Go so greater than that. What can we be looking at? They could create a generative possibility. They could create a sustainability for the earth that would be greater than we can imagine instead of these points of views that it's all doom and gloom. Yeah. You know what you're talking about? It's fascinating. We're talking about this this morning. 
um, uh, I've been following Marianne Williamson's campaign for the presidency. And uh, you know, this morning she coined a phrase on MSNBC with Stephanie Rule. So what I love about these people that interview uh, Marianne on these these uh, more popular channels, right? Let's say let's just call them that. Um, hmm. They look at her like she's got like four heads, right? <laughs> this morning, what I heard was exactly what you just described, but in a way where she answered a question about. And what she said was fascinating to me because the question that people ask her after she tells them about what is happening from a hate energy point of view, yeah. right? Then they ask her the question, so you want to do this with love? And I thought for a minute, now I know Marianne, I've interviewed her. I, I know she has got she is right on top of the edge of things and you don't really push her around very easily like most people think it's not like you bring up the word love and she get and she said something interesting and i wonder how it applies to what you're saying and here's what it was she says wait a minute kind of paraphrasing so what we've done which you don't believe is we've operationalized hate <laughs> you could hear a pin drop right now. And she went on nonstop. She said, let's talk about the operationalization of hate. And she went and she read a litany, mm -hmm. not read, but she talked about. It. And she said something like, what's so wrong about operationalizing love? And she went on and explained that. And so newsflash today probably across the Twitter feeds is a term that we are now educating people on, which you talked about a minute ago, operationalizing love energy, operationalizing it. So what you're talking about is you're operationalizing, meaning you're taking an energy field, putting it into motion, directed very specifically at an operation that mm -hmm. you would like to see happen. And yeah. it took me 15 years of doing this and a five minute interview this morning to mm -hmm. understand that we have to start talking about what we're talking about differently. We yeah. are operationalizing the energy and the power that we have within as a collective to create positive change. And that's what you just described yeah. to me. Yeah, yes. And I wouldn't say I would use the word love. No, no. But, love you're is, using I mean, but it's, it's an interesting word, love, because it, it has so much judgment around it. Everyone's point of view about what it is is completely different. Um, so that's why I tend to not use that word. The kind of love that um, she's talking about or, you know, maybe the Beatles talked about is, is more of a energy of gratitude and possibilities and kindness and caring for everyone around you. The benevolence that I've talked about. That's it. That but is, that's it. Yeah. But it's not just talking about it like you did. You didn't say, oh, Gary, okay, so we're just going to like, uh, you took an action. Mm -hmm. And we get so confused sometimes with talking about energy. And most people that hear us don't understand that there is an action and result we're striving for. Yeah. Yeah. And you, the potency you have is speaking to the energies. I mean, it, it's really how so many things are created. We never, we think it's the doing we're doing. We think it's putting the stuff in the recycling bin um, or <laughs> I mean, vegan, um, which is great for vegans. I have a hard time with that one. <laughs> are you ve do, You're not vegan, are you? No. Oh, every morning until I eat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I come pretty close. Yeah, I come pretty close. I uh, I love eggs. Mm. Easter yesterday, we had deviled eggs. I know. Yeah. No, I'm but, not vegan. I I um I actually because of the body, I ask my body what it would like, and it chooses. It could choose to be vegan for days and days and days. It can choose a red, red meat. It's you know what does my body require, just like what the earth requires, without a fixed point of view about whatever what it is. With the point of view always that I am creating greater for me and everyone around me. So that can look really different. Um, if you don't have a fixed point of view, what shows up can be kind of weird, but can actually create more. But isn't that what we're talking about today? So I want to get back to this for a minute. You know, I want to talk about what energy is generative. 
And I want to take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk about that because we talked about judgment and we talked about the idea of these are destructive, really destructive energies for Earth. Yes. But what are the generative energies? And, you know, what I loved about what we're talking about, what you did with the fire is it's the same thing that I heard this morning. And, and, and without the word operationalized in it for ma- millions of people that might be listening, the dots may not get connected that our energies have the ability to operationalize and in the world we live in manifest something we want. But when we come back, what does generative mean? What does that mean? Can we put energies towards growing new trees in a forest? Could we put energy towards having perhaps something grow in the Hudson River that will take care of the pollution? What are these and what are the greater possibilities if we do this with Dr. Glenna Rice, if we realize we have a choice, what can we do about sustainability of our future? Let's take a short break. We'll be right back. Okay. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. You're listening to Questionable Conversations, Dr. Glenna Rice and me. Today, Dr. Glenna Rice is coming to the conversation with what does the earth require from you? Uh, Later on, as we end the show, Benny has brilliantly pulled a clip from the interview that I did a number of years ago, right at the beginning of, I believe, the Obama administration. And so we're going to hear her perspective, which I think ties in very well. So we'll end the show with that. Because what we're about to talk to you about now is what energy is generative and what that means. And how does that generative energy contribute or lead to greater possibility for change. But before we do that, can you give folks an update on where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing and how they can find out all about that? Oh, yes. Um, So I'm doing energetic manual therapy classes coming up next in Hungary in May and also in Guadalajara. And um, I will looking at doing a business class in New York. That's almost on the book. That would be in July. I think I'm going to Australia too. Um, It's all at Access Consciousness dot com slash Dr. Glenna Rice. My schedule is up there. Um, oh, do I'm doing some conscious parenting two-day classes, one-day classes in Hungary and Mexico City, which I'm really excited about. I have not done a two-day conscious parents, conscious kids class. So that will be my first um, two-day class. I've done one days and evenings and lots of radio calls, but not a full two-day with parents and people that want generative possibilities for the futures of their children. So I'm excited about that class. Um, and you can also find me on Facebook. Oh, and if you would like to, uh, this is a request, uh, my YouTube channel. I want more people liking it. <laughs> I desire to, um, if I can get over a thousand people on my YouTube, so that's just Glenna Rice. Um, if you like or subscribe or whatever it is, then I can change to another level where I can monetize. And um, I have enough viewers, I just don't have enough people subscribe. So that's a request if you're listening. That's awesome. We'll make sure we help you with that. Thank cool. you. Um, Look, because that's exactly what we're talking about now. We're talking about generative energy or energy that could be generative and what that means. So let's break down for people listening. What is it? What does generative mean in the world of access consciousness, but also also in the world of the type of energy and questions we bring to the forefront? Yeah, well, generative is it's that it's generating. It's creating more. It's energies that that contribute to more possibilities that are greater than you can imagine possibilities. I mean, if your body is generative, that's what it's doing. It's creating itself greater and it's creating. That's what children's bodies do. Um, We tend to kind of stagnate that after a certain age, but that capacity never ends with our bodies and it never ends with the earth. I mean, every spring is everywhere and you see the generative capacities of the earth with the flowers coming out and the new leaves and um, the weather changing and all of those beautiful things we love about spring, having Easter yesterday, our big, our big Northern European spring festival holiday that um, is celebrated worldwide. Uh, That's what it's about. It's about honoring the generative capacities and abilities the planet has and that we have all the time. So it's really asking for that. It's not about going back or keeping things the same or looking at the past for something that was greater. It's like looking at what's possible for the future that's greater that you can imagine Um, and not trying to keep things the same. It's the change that creates more, the change that creates more possibilities. 
Um, in the world of generative, and let's just talk about this, there's a very different energy, um, certainly in psychology, where we're looking at things that we want to stop. Like whenever we want, whenever we talk about change, right? Because we are talking about change here. Um, right. Even the story you shared about the fires, you know, you are asking the wind to change. Yeah. Um, and so we are talking about change, right? Mm -hmm. But when we say the word change, and I know this is something you teach, there is change and there is change choice. And I think we should talk about change and choice together as we look at possibilities. What is the relationship? Well, change is always happening. You're not going to uh, stop. <laughs> I know. You know, I mean, change is the most um, common thing we have, right? It's happening all the time. There is no possibility. So choice is what, how would you like that change to actualize in the planet? What would you like to institute? How would you like it to look? What, what would you desire to have as your reality? Um, we will change. We, we are on this trajectory to change into a planet that is not going to be that easy to live on in the future. That's what it's looking like. Is that the change that I want to create? Change is going to happen, but you have the power. You have with your questions and then following the energy of what the possibilities of those questions present to create something different, to create something that it does not have to show up that way. This is more of a wake up call to start asking different questions than a doomsday um, message of the end of the planet. So what do, so you have the ability with your questions and your points of views to create something that's different than the doomsday that's out there. We love that story. Oh my gosh, it's all over movies. I enjoy those doomsday stories and then you just break out at the end. I'm an action lover, action film lover. Um, but that's not the reality we have to create. If we keep aligning and agreeing with that point of view and resisting and reacting and fighting that point of view, that out of difficult and start asking for something that's greater. It could just simply what possibility that's greater than I can ever imagine for planet earth is now available. You could just wake up and ask a simple question like that and just let it go. What's available. That may, that message, that energy may go into someone who has a, the most amazing idea how to, create air that's not polluted, that's not, you know, and still have cars. I don't know. Th those possibilities are only available if we ask the questions. If we're not asking the questions and we're in the conclusion, those possibilities won't be seen. We're like distracted by the propaganda of the doomsday and we won't be able to see the possibilities that will actually change it. So we can't contribute to those. And what can you contribute to? What is occurring that, that lights you up, that looks like a possibility that you can contribute to by a doing, but also by just energetically contributing to these these possibilities that are generative, to create well, something sustainable. Yeah, I think part of this too is we're starting to hear language change. Mm. You know, we're starting to hear the language change. Let me give you, let me just pop something your way just to see. There's something called the Heart of Green Awards now. Heart of Green Awards. So you see how we're shifting, Absolutely. right? The, 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 let's call it the generative energy of things now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so this is really something that we watch and we lean into. And people want to know if we go back to what you said originally, you know, what if every choice, choice this is your question, Glenna, which I want to explore maybe, but let's just go ahead and skip the break. Um, what if every choice you made included the awareness of what it will create now and in the future for you and the planet? So let's say that again, because the minute I say that, I, I, I'm picking up energy of like, yeah, right. What if every choice you made included the awareness of what it will create now and in the future for you and the planet? Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, if you sit down with an 11 year old like I do from time to time, they are very clear. This little, this young woman, this 11 year old 
is very clear about every choice that she makes and yeah. a, and has an awareness of it that her Yeah. Or even if, yeah, very clear. How uh, powerful um, is that question? Uh, it, there's so much potency in those questions. There's so much power. I, I mean, that's one of the things that has been really different with the access tools raising my children is always asking them about what each choice they create and allowing them to choose, but choose from an awareness of what it created. And if they chose something that didn't work out so well, looking back, so what, what choice did you make that created this? And how could you choose different? What else could you choose? You know, asking like I ask for most um, relationships and those kind of things. If I choose this for my life, my reality, and my reality includes the planet in five years, 10 years. And now we're asking like thousand years, 10,000 years. You know, if that, like we talked about the Hudson, if they said uh, dumping these needles or this, oil into this, what's that going to create in 10,000 years? And then you get an awareness of what it is. You're not going to know exactly, obviously. You don't have, you know, you're not going to have a storybook of your future, but you'll have an energetic awareness of it going or going. And if you follow the ones that do this, everything gets greater in your life. And what, and that would be such a wonderful target is if more people were asking that way and looking at whatever it's not, you know, a lot of people are talking about, you want to be in the present. You want to be in the present. Yes. You want to be present and you want every choice you make to create something greater for your future and for now and for your future, always including your future. Then everything you're doing is creating more. And it's not just for you. I mean, we, the younger generations are the ones that are really speaking out now, the leaders that are coming, the leaders for the future that are coming out um, of these, you know, the younger people that have been elected into Congress and you're hearing some running for president, the 37, that what they're talking about is the future. And they'll be here for that future. I'll be here for that future. My kids will. It's really something that um, I'm hearing more and more from younger generations. I would include myself maybe in those. I'm kind of on the edge, huh? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> Where no, do I go, I, younger? <laughs> well, no, I totally agree with it because I work with... I work with uh, people of all ages. So, you know, especially young women. And so part of this is really keeping and staying plugged in to the influence and the influencers and yeah. what that means. Because, you know, part of this is, I think you say this, right? You know, we're talking about sustainability as a process of main change and maintaining change. And, and I think one of the things you say, and perhaps you could talk about it, is change in a balanced environment, you know, in which exploitation of resources and investments and technological developments and all of the above, right? We're talking about what we do to operationalize this energy is going to take us into a future that's going to meet human needs and aspirations, but at the same time, does it without compromising our planet, future generations, and today's world. Yeah, a lot of um, the conversation that when you talk about sustainability is about how people lose out. You know, there's not going to be enough. You're going to have to limit what you can have um, and use and eat and play with, and your all these things will be limited if we do sustainability. Mm -hmm. But what if that's not true? Mm -hmm. It certainly doesn't feel light to me when I hear it. Mm -hmm. The Earth is a generative, abundant planet, abundant planet. There is so much here that's available. If we are in a communion, which is what you know the Earth really requires of us, is to have an awareness of it, to listen to it, and to have a communion that allows us to have that, what are we going to be limited if we have sustainability? Or is it that everyone's going to have an abundance as much as they choose every day? Some people want more than others mm -hmm. and the future it will be available in the future. You're not going to be using things that people can't have and you won't have to limit yourself now. That's not what we're talking about when you talk about sustainability. It's mm -hmm. that there will be an abundance for everyone now and in the future. And we may not even have any idea what that's going to look like yet. Yeah. You know, it's interesting we're talking about this because, uh, you know, the conversation has really broadened. 
right? And so there's this uh, 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 energy that you're talking about, the generative energy of this. And, you know, it used to be what you're talking about, right? What you and I were talking about is really the judgments around this and what not to do and the damage. So what we're now seeing in the world, like, for example, the climatecoalition.org. You know, mm. if you go to the climatecoalition.org and you'll see that they have these awards, Green Heart Hero Awards, right? And so when you go to their website, they have approached this in exactly the way you talk about. So they talk about most sustainable visitor site. Then they talk about sustainability in sport. Then they talk about greenest school or youth project, greenest business, greenest mm. overseas project, rural innovation, greenest MP, greenest new MP, most inspirational community project, most inspirational community individual. See, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> I just get excited hearing about all those possibilities. I right? mean, the abundance in all of those, the jobs that are created, the money and the wealth that can be generated from creating all of the things you just listed off to in the government's investing in those. You know, what can we create with that? How exciting. And um, I'm going to have to go to their their website right after yeah. the call because I got just, wow. Well, they're interesting because these are folks, they talk about time is now. They talk about go for zero. They're talking about things in the way that I believe you mentioned earlier when you talked about the Green New Deal earlier when we brought yeah. that up, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the Green New Deal, believe it or not, it's all about possibilities, isn't it? It is. It absolutely is. In fact, I, the, um, Acacia Cortez was talking with so many of these words I use, possibilities and future and um, change. So, yes, that's what it's about, which kind of makes some people uncomfortable. If you don't like change, things like this will make you uncomfortable. But I'm sorry, it's going to happen. Change will happen. You can't stop change. Yeah. Uh, all of the above. Yeah. yeah. And so let's bring it back to where we started from, because this is really the question. What does the earth require from us, from you, from me? What does the earth require? And we have so many metaphors or so many constructs that we've created about the earth, right? Mother earth is wounded. Mother earth is crying, right? right. Um, but mother earth is also informing us. You know, Mother Earth is providing us with information on a regular basis mm -hmm. so that we will awaken to a new possibility for the Earth. I mean, yeah. every day we're getting more information from the Earth in the way that the Earth knows how to operationalize the energy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it does come in the wake of destructive energies, right? Fire, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Or change in weather so to speak we do have, yes. right because obviously we need to have destructive energy for us to pay attention to do the right thing here right yeah but, unfortunately but what, that is that I, sometimes the wake-up calls can be oh kind. my gosh right but here we are what does the earth what is the earth glenna what does the earth require from us you know i mean you asking it i'm going i don't have an answer for each one of you what the earth requires this is a question it's about asking the question that you can wake up every morning and ask and say okay today what does the earth require of me and then then listen be aware you'll hear whispers i mean when i the fire moment it was just what's required here what does the what do the houses require of us and it was something completely different. And it, and the, it was a whisper from the earth that I heard the wind, the wind. And then the kids, can we change the wind? That it, being having that kind of communion so you can hear the earth's whispers, which are very loud and substantial, but they sound more like whispers until you get better at it. Um, then you can start having the awareness of what it requires of you. Yeah. You know, you're very fortunate because you have children that have grown up in this particular generational era, yeah. right? So they've grown up. They have seen things that my generation didn't see. We saw something different. You know, right. we had a different cause, uh, you know, growing up and being your children's age. But it doesn't matter what that was. The real question is, what are the energies that we're going to bring forth that would 
in Marianne Williamson's word, I love this operationalized words because every CEO on the planet uses that word, by the way. Yeah. yeah right. Because C E O O operation, right? You right. Know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what would it look like for us to operationalize generative energies for the planet? Oh, that was that a uh, did I do a what's what's the access consciousness question for that? <laughs> no, that was good. <laughs> was it good? Oh boy, I think I learned something. Well, it's like who could you be that would create um, a greater source of possibility for planet Earth? What could you do? What could you be? What could you ask? What could you generate that would create a greater source of possibility for planet Earth? Maybe that we've greater than we've ever had before than you've ever been. And I can't tell you the answer. There's not an answer. That's an energy you ask. And then once you ask it, everything starts to contribute to what that is. And being out of judgment, which is the big thing, you know, no judgment allows you to see the possibilities. The judgment stops you from seeing the possibilities. When you're out of judgment, you can see the possibilities of what that would be for you. You know, I asked a question the other day. I, I thought I was going to get thrown out of the meeting when <laughs> I was at the other. That's how I think you know you're doing pretty good stuff when yeah. you're, you're threatening the very fabric of capitalism. And I, the question I asked was, what if everything we purchased beginning tomorrow on planet Earth, what if everything we purchased were wrapped in paper and not plastic? What if everything that required a container had a disposable container within a shelf life of six months? Yeah. What if nothing ever, ever again had to be wrapped, double wrapped, advertisement wrapped, make it look pretty wrapped, and, and I mentioned perfume, by the way. Yeah. What if there was another way to take product to market? That is oh, a, my God. I love your questions. I have questions very similar. Those oh, are my gosh. Great. Yeah. Some, some, you know, tech company is going to, or some manufacturing chemical engineer, someone's going to hear that question and become a multimillionaire off of it. Exactly. Possibly. Exactly. The person that comes up with that is, is going to have a very happy, abundant life and it'll create something greater on the planet. Well, look, I got to tell you uh, so much we talked about today. Thank you. And yeah. Dr. Glenna Rice, go to the website, drglennarice.com. We're going to end this show with a clip, right? Mm -hmm. To hear what Gloria Rubin said right at the beginning of the Obama administration, I believe, about her belief in hope. And that's what we're talking about today. Thank you, Glenna. Thank you, Dr. Pat. Thank you, Benny. Take it away, Benny. I have a great deal of faith in the people of this country, and I have an extraordinary amount of faith in this new administration, even though there's still some things that need to be improved upon and, and some ways that they need to be more leaders on a couple of issues when it comes to the environment. At least they are pointed, they are faced in the right direction. So that gives me a great deal of hope because I know that the United States, you know, I was born in Canada and I've lived here in the U.S. for 20 years now, and I just recently became a U.S. citizen. Just over two months ago, I, I took the oath to the flag because I have such faith in this country, and I know that the United States will once again lead on this issue or lead on this most vital issue of the environment and of climate change. So, But our leaders need to hear from us. Thank you for listening to Questionable Conversations Radio with Dr. Glenna Rice. Tune in each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com as Dr. Glenna explores different parenting methods, examines healthier lifestyles, and explores what else is possible to guide you toward a successful career. For more information or to listen to past shows, visit GlennaRice.com. That's GlennaRice.com. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Questionable Conversations Radio with Dr. Glenna Rice. Tune in each month on TransformationTalkRadio.com as Dr. Glenna explores different parenting methods, 
examines healthier lifestyles, and explores what else is possible to guide you toward a successful career. For more information or to listen to past shows, visit glennarice.com. That's glennarice.com. See you next time.